I want to welcome all of you to our Friday research seminar. And uh, as Marie mentioned, we have two groups of audiences here. One who's present here physically and the other that's joining us from Zoom. And just a little bit of housekeeping. Call for those of you who are joining us via Zoom, we have, uh, for safety reasons, opted to use the webinar style. So that means your microphones are muted. Uh, and uh, what we will do is if you have any questions, please put those questions in the chat box and we will be monitoring uh, your uh, chat in the seminar and we will be reading the questions out loud so that our speaker can hear the questions and also the audience that is joining us physically here, they can hear the questions. Okay? So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Zimmerman today and Dr. Zimmerman is the Marshall H. Becker Collegiate Professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan. And Dr. Zimmerman serves as the Director of the Prevention Research Center of Michigan and the CDC-funded Youth Violence Prevention Center. Dr. Zimmerman earned his BS in Psychology from the University of Massachusetts and in an MS in Community Psychology from the University of Oregon, the other school in Oregon. <laughs> uh, and he received his PhD in psychology, personality, and social ecology from the University of Illinois. Dr. Zimmerman's research focuses on adolescent health and resiliency and empowerment theory. Uh, Dr. Zimmerman's talk today is entitled Transform Translating Theory to Action, a Story of Youth Violence Prevention. So please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Zimmerman. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I love being back here. Just so um, I don't know how many people there. And it's sort of funny talking to a room and talking to a um, whatever they are. You know, the, you know, the virtual world. Um, I'm real. I'm here. I'm not virtual. Um, but in uh, uh, I'm I'm. I spent four years of my life at, in Eugene, Oregon from 1977 to 1981. And Oregon has always had a special place in my heart. Um, I always root for Oregon in sports and stuff. And I'm sorry, it's not OSU, it's the University of Oregon, but it's still the state and we are all in the state. Um, but it's really great to be back. And I, I just, I love it. I, I love this place uh, in so many ways. It's just a beautiful place. So thank you for inviting me and having me here. Um, and I've enjoyed our conversations thus far. So that's been very cool too. So let me just say everything I learned, I learned in kindergarten. Um, so real quickly, um, I, you know, we we're uh, taught to hold hands and stick together, clean up after yourself, uh, treat others the way you want to be treated. Don't hit people. These are all pieces of advice that I learned in kindergarten that many of us did that have actually guided my entire career uh, and the work that we do. Um, you also want to be aware of wonder. Um, just you know, it, allow yourself to experience things that you might otherwise not experience, and and wonderful things end up happening. All of those things have driven uh, my career. So I'm, that's really um, the underlying theory. That isn't the only theory I'm going to be talking about today, though. Uh, oh, and by the way, since we're in a, a college of public health, always wash your hands before you eat. That was just another one. It has nothing to do with what I'm going to be talking about, but it's just good public health advice. Um, I also want to acknowledge that uh, uh, I'm going to come full circle and talk about each one of these, but uh, these are the colleagues and the centers and the institutes and the work that I've been doing that has culminated in uh, where I'm going to end today, which is the Institute for Firearm injury prevention and sort of a little story about how we got there, uh, but um, uh, it, it's, it was via doing some uh, adolescent resilience research and then so forth and so on. So let me just go and start talking about this. Um, we uh, are studying youth violence uh, and basically it's the idea that it's, uh, it's interpersonal um, and it's uh, uh, intentional and it's injurious. And injurious doesn't have to be just physical, it can be psychological. And it can be uh, social, Maybe isolation would be an example of an, in, uh, isolating people uh, as well as bullying them. 
20% of kids in high schools across America uh, have said um, they've been bullied. 25% have said they have been in a fight. One in, five, one in four, one in five have been bullied. One in four have been in a physical fight. 6% um, have said they've carried a weapon to school. Um, actually, 6% said, 18% they said they carried a weapon. 6% said they carried a gun. 6% of high school kids in America, according to YRBS, said they carried a gun. The average size of a high school in the United States is a little over 500 people. 6% of that is 30 people. In the state of Oregon, the, the average size of a high school is slightly smaller, about 430 or so. Call it 400. That means 6% of that number is 24. There are 48 weeks in a school year. Every other week, on average, there's a gun in a high school in America today, in actually in, uh, in the state of Oregon. So uh, it is um, a significant issue. Uh, 16 kids between the ages of 10 to 24 die every day from, a, um, from violence. And mostly, most of the time, that's a gunshot. It's the number one cause of death for uh, Native, for African Americans in the United States, African American youth in the United States. An African American male is 15 times more likely than, a, than their white counterparts to die of homicide, 15 times more. So there's significant health disparities here. Um, these data are old, but there have been, there's a, a, a age 10 to 24, there's about over a half a million uh, ER visits a day. A year, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, this is also very old data, but a quarter of a billion dollars of spent is spent on the cost of those uh, of homicides and, and injury from violence. Back to kindergarten. Okay, so you know, with that backdrop and that uh, and and a lot of that stuff, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about firearms in particular. A lot of that stuff is is violence in general. Um, some of it is specifically to firearms. Some homicide mostly is firearms. But let's go back to kindergarten. Be aware of wonder. Well, one of the things that I, when I first started my career, we did some work in Flint. We worked in the Flint high schools and we asked and we were, we were interested in uh, resiliency, uh, developing the idea of resiliency theory. Uh, Michael Rudder developed that theory, that idea way back when. It actually refers to physical science. Resilience is how much a material can go without breaking. And so and you, that metaphor in humans is how far do we go and what helps us come back from uh, the traumas that we might incur, whether those are the ACEs that some of you may have heard about, uh, um, adverse childhood experiences, uh, ne abuse, neglect, or whether it's trauma of seeing uh, somebody shot in your neighborhood or across the street, or whether it's trauma of just being bullied in school. I don't mean just, I shouldn't have used that word. So what we did is uh, we wanted to see, well, um, what's been driving my entire career is sort of the more positive things in life. We talked about that earlier. And so it was resiliency theory was what was guiding this work. And the idea of resilience is Instead of uh, cataloging risk factors, it's trying to catalog positive factors. We call them promotive factors. You'll often hear them called protective factors, but there's different kinds of variables that might be positive or promotive. So we, I prefer to use the term promotive because there are protective factors and there are compensatory factors. And analytically, with statistics, we, use, we do a slightly different approach. Uh, and then uh, when when they're when they moderate or interact, they're called protective factors. When it's a main effect, counteracts it, has an opposite effect than um, a risk factor, then we call that uh, a compensatory factor. And so together, they're promotive factors rather than call them all protective factors. But it's the same idea. So this is the Flint Adolescent Study where we studied in 1994. We followed high school freshmen, um, and we studied them for 12 years. It was not, wasn't always co so consecutive, but we have 12 years of data on these folks. Um, and we found uh, basically, and I'm only summarizing, I mean, there are many, many, many big papers. And if I just quickly go back here, uh, I invite any of you, is, is this a, a pointer if I point in the middle? Yeah. Um, this, you know, if you're interested, these websites, 
they're all they're all sph.umich.edu and then the the name of the project so this one's called the flint adolescent study or fas i invite you there there's all sorts of other uh, resiliency studies that we've done uh, we've looked at substance use and violent behavior we've looked at mentors and um, some of the work that we found is uh, we looked at ethnic identity we worked with uh, rob sellers using his measure of ethnic identity called the multi-dimensional uh, uh, multi, uh, maybe the multi-phasic inventory of black identity, where he looks at uh, public regard, what people think about, uh, but in this case, African Americans. What's their opinion about African Americans? Uh, private regard, what you think about yourself, and then thirdly, uh, centrality. How central is being African American to your identity? Yeah, are the three kinds of measures, and we find that when kids report. And different combinations of these, but basically, um, they if they have a strong identity and they feel that uh, there's a positive view of them of either themselves or other people have a positive view of their African Americanness, their blackness, that that's related to less problem behavior and related to more positive behavior. So we so said that's interesting, a promotive factor potentially. So we actually then developed a program where we helped kids develop that positive identity. Uh, adults, we found that adults are important in lives. Uh, parents remain important in kids' lives in high school and beyond. Parents matter. But also, and importantly here, we found that mentors, if they have somebody who's older than them that they can go to and share ideas or get some advice or you know, borrow the car even, all kinds of support from mentors, that that's also a positive factor, a promotive factor in kids' lives. And we found these to be either compensatory or protective in all kinds of analyses and all kinds of different ways. Um, we also found um, that when kids engaged in positive activities outside of school, extracurricular activities, that those things were also positive, compensatory, and, and promotive. So what we did is we used that to um, uh, re basically respond to an RFA that said, we wanna do community change. We wanna, CDC said, we wanna fund a project that um, is focused on community change. And so we said, okay, let's translate what we just found, identity, adults, and engagement, and let's create a program where kids are a part of the solution instead of a focus of the problem. So um, we got this idea of, you know, don't hit people, right? So we created this program called Youth Empowerment Solutions. Uh, it's designed for an after-school program. Uh, it is um, uh, mainly, it was originally designed for uh, middle school age kids, sixth, seventh, eighth graders. Uh, we have worked with folks around the country who have wanted to implement it. I'm gonna show some data. It's gonna be a little bit of the data that I will show um, uh, that um, showed its effectiveness. They found that it was effective. CDC is now sort of, touted it. Uh, I think we made the, we made the, um, I think in an odd sort of way, we, we've made it with this program because in the last call for youth violence prevention centers that CZ, CDC put out, they said, you cannot use yes to promote to in your proposal. And I thought like, are they telling me that I shouldn't apply? What is, what's going on here? Uh, but they basically said, no, it's because it's already shown to be effective. So we want to do something more you know, new and stuff like that. So I took that as a as a major compliment. Um, but again, uh, the the yes, um, the yes is yes.sph.umich.edu. I um, there there's all sorts of videos there. There's the the publications that came out of this. There's you can download the curriculum for free. You can download the um, the evaluation materials for free. You can download uh, uh, adaptation guides all for free. It's publicly funded, so we thought we'd make it all uh, free. If people have, as they have in, in all across the country, have asked us to help them with training, we charge for that. But we've made this all free, freely available. So I invite you to use it. Um, your tax dollars paid for it. So, um, so we turn that into this program, which is a basically like a 24 to 30 uh, session program depends how long and how much time that schools have or that community-based programs have to implement it. 
Um, but we basically um, created this program where kids, where the youth hold hands uh, and stick together um, because we use this idea of empowerment theory. Now, the way empowerment theory works is empowering processes lead to empowerment outcomes. And that is the idea is that it really leads to positive youth development. So let me just talk a little bit about empowering processes or processes where you feel agency, where you feel like you own what's there, you, if you create it, you have control, and um, it, there, are, there are activities where you are the one or the ones that create the, the change. And that's what we sort of did. We said, let's create this curriculum so that it's built around helping kids create that community change and be part of the solution. So the beginning parts of the, of the curriculum uh, focus on uh, things like uh, team building and rule setting. So we, one of the first things we do with them is we say, okay, how do you guys wanna behave together? And then we write up rules of engagement and then we hold that up to them to say, when somebody acts out or somebody doesn't you know, behave the way they said, these are your rules. They, you, what do you want to do about that? So we wanted them to kind of basically own it from the, from the big, very beginning and then learn how to work together. Because kids and our educational system, all the way up into even master's degrees, um, you don't really work in teams. Yet in real life, you never work alone. Very rarely are you working alone. You know, you're, you know, you're helping write a grant proposal or you're uh, working on the budget, but you you have meetings. And I mean, I spend my day in meetings. I spend my night trying to do my work, but I spend the day in meetings because you're constantly working with people. So we had to help them develop a team, team building, basically. So we have these different exercises. We also created the curriculum. One of the things we said was we do not want to make it more school. The last thing kids want, especially middle school age kids, is more school. So we tried to make it fun, very active kind of learning. So they do that. They do some photo voice where they start thinking analytic, thinking critically about their community. We give them assignments. They take pictures. They talk about those pictures. Where, where is safe? Where is not safe? Why is this place safe? Why is this not? What do you think? What would you do about it? Then we help them develop what it takes to create a program or identify a, a, a community change project. All of that is the um, is sort of the kind of processes. Outcomes are things that is basically based on the, the empowerment theory that I and others have somewhat promoted, um, but it's the idea of thinking, feeling, and doing. They have to uh, have the intrapersonal view that they can control, beliefs in themselves, self-efficacy, is an example of that. But it's more than self-efficacy, it's motivation to control, it's feeling like they can make a difference. Uh, the, then there's the thinking part, and that's thinking about causal agents. That's thinking about critically about their, their place in the world and, and why do things happen the way they do? Learn, helping them think critically. Adolescent's brain isn't fully developed until you're about 25 years old. Um, women, girls are a little bit sooner, Boys are a little bit later on in general, but all of the synapses are not firing. And they're certainly not firing at age 10, 12, 13. So what we're trying to do is help them make those connections. Uh, so there's a, the intrapsychic, or the, I'm sorry, the inter, what we call the interactional component. So there's feeling, but there's also being able to think critically and developing those skills. And then there's doing. And that's like, we have to give them opportunities to then practice what they think and feel. So there's the thinking, feeling, doing components, and then we have uh, the outcomes that we're looking at. So of course, our primary processes is our curriculum, this 30-session um, curriculum. The outcomes I just described to you, we have measures of efficacy and, uh, and self-esteem. We have measures of um, thinking critically about the world and, and that they know what it takes to make something happen. Uh, and you could get all these measures on the, on the web and all that sort of thing. And what we found, so we, this is what we tested and we tested it for pro-social and problem behavior. So let me quickly just show you. Um, oh, I, 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 I um, let me just, I just told you about the project goals. Take a look at this picture for a minute. Uh, keep that in your mind, in your head, because I'm gonna come back to that wall. Uh, but you can see they're whitewashing the side. This is a, um, uh, a strip mall. 
They're standing in a dirt parking lot that's next to it that's not used very often. Uh, there's other parking that people use, but it is overflow parking. But it's a it's a dirt um, it's a dirt parking lot. But they're they're painting the side. So the project goals are basically to help the, provide the the scaffolding for them to learn how to make a change. I mean, when you think about this, we take it for granted, but it's not simple to mail a letter, honestly. There's a lot of steps to mailing a letter. You have to realize you need a stamp. You have to realize you need an address. You have to put it on a, a return address. You have to figure out what you're going to put in. you got to make sure it goes in the right envelope, right? And then there might be a deadlines and all those other things. And that's just mailing something. But imagine trying to create a community project, whether it's a community celebration, which some of the kids did, or whether it's a mural, which I'm going to talk about, or anything in between. How do you do a mural? I don't know how you paint. I don't know how you do a mural. I do know you need paint. You probably need a ladder. You probably need brushes. You might need different kinds of brushes. What color paint do you need? Where do you get paint? Where do you get brushes? Can I borrow a ladder? Or how, where are we going to get the resources to do all this? So we're trying to help them sort of develop their executive function, if you will. So let me. Uh, this is where I think I need to uh, go over here. So these are some of the videos that you can see on the screen. I'm going to let the kids talk for themselves. I think that our YES program this year has really empowered the students that were involved with the planning process and the implementation process. The whole point of having this project is to show our students that documents and content, instruments, and a project that can we do need a change, and the change is the children. You know, it sounds very cliche, but the children are the future. Helping the community and what Romney helps you, the YES program is an asset because it builds pride amongst the children. Yeah. Getting this opportunity to do something positive for their school and their community, and then being able to show it off and take part and be like, I did that, I made that happen. So let me talk a little bit about, um, the, the, by the way, we had IRB approval. Those are all the kids who were in the program, but their parents signed off. We had a six page consent form, a six page, you know, you think about that, is this informed consent? Did the parents read that? Did the kids get the assent and read all those? Who knows? We obviously went through it all. Uh, I was shocked that they had us do that. But we went back and asked them, can we use your kids' photos? We have photos for them. They, were, they knew they were going to be in the videos. A master's student in our program did her internship in, in develop, learning how to, um, learning how to uh, uh, do uh, uh, documentary filmmaking. So when she came back, I said, I'll hire you to do this. We'll, get some, we'll borrow some cameras. Actually, I ended up buying her a camera. Um, that uh, was uh, that she used for this, and so, um, and they're all most of the videos are from her, and they're they're terrific, I think. So some of the evaluation results. First, we did a process evaluation of this study, and what we did was we uh, talked to the kids in the beginning and afterwards. The, the very first time we did it, we didn't know what we were doing. You know, we we had an idea that we had to get them scaffolding, but we had no idea. I mean, we had obviously some idea about development and where they were. But we started really that first year. We had we had a lot a lot of learning. One of the things is we um, we found three key issues. One is the kids complained that the adults were too controlling. So we had a we had to train the adults. We had to talk to the adults about what kind of expectations. Like they're there just to help. So when we first did this, we had all these retired teachers who volunteered 
they got paid a little bit. So they virtually volunteered to be the teachers. Now, at first I thought, oh, that's great. Who better to implement this than former teachers? And then I realized like, that's about the worst possible person to pick because the people, um, the, what are teachers good at? Among other things, they're good at controlling a class of 30 you know, or 40 12 year olds. So they're all about control. And so they were sort of, the kids complained. They said, well, you got these teachers and they're doing all this stuff, and, but they, I, you said it was gonna be our program. So we obviously apologized and we got younger adults and our, our solution was we hired undergraduates from you know, University of Michigan Flint. Um, again, we approved uh, adult trainings. And then we also found that uh, the adults who did work on it needed more support. So we, we basically used the process evaluation to improve the program. We also looked at outcome evaluation. What we really found um, at 30 day that uh, when we looked at positive effects, now these, we did structural equation modeling. We, this is all, you know, again, you can read the paper and I don't have the site here, but if you go to the website, you can get the site. But quickly, or just basically that uh, the, the program had the effects on, uh, on the uh, empowering outcomes, or empowerment outcomes that we talked about, the thinking, feeling, doing, and then those had very, very strong and positive effects in a comparison group design. We actually looked at dose effect because what we also found is kids came for a little while and then basketball season started and some of them dropped out. So what we did is we looked at dose effects um, and then we asked them, what did they pay attention to? And so we used those as the independent variable. Uh, but we basically found that it was related to a more pro-social behavior, a stronger uh, working in school and uh, some decision-making measures. When we looked at um, negative behaviors, interestingly, the effects were exactly as we expected, but not as strong. And of course, you know, I was, at first I was thinking like, oh, well, I guess it didn't really improve what we hoped it would improve. But what it did do, and when you think about this, is the intervention is focused on very positive things. So of course, very positive behavior. So, you know, thinking, feeling, doing. So it increased the positive behaviors more than it decreased the negative behaviors, but it still had the effect in the negative behaviors. Um, when we did it one year results, also published paper, uh, we, we found that it did have a stronger effect on general oppositional behavior. Um, this is the mural that, that they were painting. Um, and I, I'll just quickly tell you this story. And the words that the kids use in that video and the words that they've used to describe this, we didn't prompt them. We didn't give them a script. They talked about it. Same with the teachers. They use those words themselves. And so um, they, there's a song that they one, of, one, of the, one group created, and it's also very telling. And we didn't, you know, we didn't tell them to what to say in that song. They wrote a rap song, which uh, I have played before. I took it out, but I have played before. If you want, we can go to it and I can play it. But uh, in the meantime, just real quickly, this is also their story. Uh, but this is one of my favorite murals, maybe because I know the whole story. But um, they learn about uh, the slave trade. So you, you can see the shackles falling to the ground and the slave boats sinking to the bottom. So that's part of the identity development. They learn about African-American history. They learn about Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. They learn about Harriet Tubman and other people as well. So things to be, a, to be proud of. They also learn that alcohol and firearms and guns, and so all that's sinking to the bottom. Over here, the buildings represent old people. So they're getting the message of old people and young people have to work together. The, this represents young people, the flowers. Then there's a bridge that's missing, is not, complete, not com completely connected. So what connects them? The love boat, their story. And then one of them wrote a poem and said, well, I have coursing through my veins uh, royalty and I will rise from the ashes like the phoenix bird. And that's basically the poem all the way through it. I just love that. And again, their story. What we did is we helped them identify some, um, uh, they said they want to do a mural. Well, you gotta find a wall. Well, you can't just pick any wall, you gotta get permission. Um, and do you know how to do a mural? No, so we said, well, let's talk to some mural artists. So we had them interview mural artists. They, get to, they picked one that they wanted to work with. The mural artist helped them kind of, they designed this, but the mural artist helped them tweak it a little bit. And then they, well, what do you do now? And that's where the paints and the brushes and all that sort of thing. Uh, just this quickly, this next picture is, I just give you a sense of the scale. And these are all the kids who painted it. 
Um, so now that we see one of the reasons that we got this funding was, did you make community change that didn't, it did it address public health? I mean, did it address violent behavior? And what this slide really quickly is showing is that at 100 meters, the yellow is the um, before the project and um, the blue is after the project. So at 100 meters from that, me from that mural or from other murals that they did or they did community gardens and other things like that. So whenever they did a spatial something in space, we looked at before, after. And we've, what we're finding is that about 100 meters, a football field, 50 yards in either direction, it looks like it's making, a, these are significant effects. And at 200 meters, also still holding. 300 meters, still holding, but starting to have less of an effect. And then by 400 meters, there's actually, it flips. But basically, it, you know, you wouldn't expect the, the, the effect to occur further and further out. And this almost, in some ways, validates what we're saying, that if you can transform that. Well, one of the big problems with this, of course, is that we don't have a control group. All we have is pre-post of those sites. So not a great experiment, but preliminary data, which led us to this idea of cleaning up after yourself, another lesson from kindergarten. And this is where we created this idea of busy streets theory. The idea of busy streets theory, what we noticed is, wow, you clean it up and there's less violence? This is interesting. Well, we then discovered two movements that were happening, one in criminology and one in arch arch architecture. The criminology is called crime prevention through environmental design, where if you have good sight lines and good lighting and show ownership of the place, that's going to send messages that maybe crime won't happen there because people are watching. At the same time, the, about the same time, uh, architecture was also talking about creating spaces in cities where uh, there's bigger sight lines open. And there's some debate about who really kind of came up with that. That's why I'm going to acknowledge both those fields. So we took it. And of course, about the same time, there was this idea of, uh, of uh, broken windows theory, which uh, I've been criticized sometimes for the way I represent this, but it has been interpreted in general. It's not maybe how they in intended in the beginning blanking on the guy's name at the moment. It's not exactly how we meant it in, intentionally, but it, it was called broken windows theory. And people have this idea. One broken window leads to another broken window that leads to the slow decline of a neighborhood. Because why? Well, no one's paying attention. Let's throw another rock. Let's break another window. Well, no one's paying attention. Let's do this. Well, now suddenly people are starting to do very nefarious things, whether it's drug dealing or whether it's uh, robbing houses, uh, burglarizing house or whatever it is, it's the slow, to, the idea of broken windows theory as it's been taken up is that the slow decline of a neighborhood starts when you start sending messages that people aren't paying attention. So we said, well, consistent with resiliency theory, which is looking at the positive things, consistent with empowerment theory, which is the idea of, of uh, helping people develop the skills and the, and the knowledge and the, uh, the kids in particular, uh, to, to make change and be active change agents, we said, well, what if we came up with this idea of busy streets theory? If you walk around, if, any, if you ever walk around the New York City, for example, you're gonna look for a street that's busy to walk on. You, you may get pickpocketed, you probably won't, but you might, low level crime. But if it's a busy street, you're unlikely to get stabbed or beaten up or something like that, there's too many eyes. So when you're walking around in cities, you often wanna walk on the busy street, right? And so that's where we came up with this idea of busy streets. What happens if you improve the neighborhood and then make, make the neighborhood a better place, like what we found in that pilot study that I just described from the youth violence, from the uh, YES program? So we um, basically said there's two necessary conditions. One is you have to improve physical spaces and you have to engage residents in the process. Again, empowerment theory. Um, and uh, this is basically how it works, is community-engaged SEPTED, crime prevention through environmental design, um, and then it improves safety, may improve health and well-being. We're looking at this right now in our current prevention research center. Safety is what we focused on, and then that would relate to busy streets. And so uh, one of the things we did is we did a study where we compared street segments, a block, from one corner to another, roughly the same size, and then we said there's some street segments in similar kind of neighborhoods, 
So the same level of vacancy, the same level of um, lower uh, uh, economic status of the neighborhood we're using uh, census tract data, as comparable as we could make it, as, as we could compare the two. We had two conditions. We had uh, people mowing lawns and taking care of it and none. And we found a 40% drop in assaults using police incident data. And again, you can uh, go to our websites and you can get these, these studies. So, uh, so we found pretty compelling evidence right there. And then we've now built on that in many ways. We currently just got funded to study dumping. Because what we did in one of our projects is we brought together people from Camden, New Jersey, Youngstown, Ohio, and Flint, Michigan, three very highly vacant places where there's a lot of empty lots so there'd be a, a house that would get dilapidated, start falling apart, they would be torn down, it'd be an empty lot. In the city of Flint, there are 10,000 of these, 10,000 empty lots. There's more than that actually, but there's 10,000 are, are now run by uh, a group called the Land Bank. And it's a, it's a, the, the state of Michigan has allowed um, uh, counties to take over land that has no longer being um, taken care of by the owner. There's there arrears with their taxes. There's a process to have that occurs and the land banks take it back. Detroit is another one. Detroit had 10,000 demolitions done in one year. 10,000 demolitions. That creates 10,000 empty lots and they already had a bunch of empty lots. And now what happens on an empty lot is nobody's there on the street watching. And you could, I could show you places in Flint where there might be five or six empty lots where normally there would be, you know, in many of the neighborhoods that you all live in. I, I don't think there's a big um, uh, vacancy problem here in, uh, in Corvallis. Uh, but you can imagine if on your street you had five or six less houses. And what happens to those lots, right? They get overgrown. And what one of the things that our community partners in those three cities said is we have a huge dumping problem because what happens? People will uh, renovate their house and they have all this waste that they have to get rid of and it's expensive. And in, in the dark of night, they'll come to an empty lot and they dump it. Or I have, I have a, what needed a new washing machine. It's gonna cost me $30 to have them haul it away for me. I'll take care of it in the dark of night, drive it down the street to the empty lot and throw it in it. You know, same thing with garbage. And so they said dumping is a huge problem. So right now we have a randomized controlled trial looking at different uh, dumping interventions to prevent dumping from occurring. It's a pretty interesting problem actually. So, um, so we've also done some qualitative work. We asked people who are engaged in this, these changes, we've asked them, what do you think? And this is uh, what some of them have said, oh, it didn't work. Wait, I need to press this. I really feel like we're growing closer as a community, at least knowing that, hey, there's good people out here and a lot of people willing to help. Before it was kind of doom and gloom. It's getting a little bit of a different perspective now. People just really need to see it. Hey, somebody does care about this. Other than just us. We're not in this alone. And as long as we're not in this alone, we will take ownership and responsibility. Then there's also this idea of they're feeling better in places that are cleaned up and uh, and working. It's cleaner, it's brighter, feels better. Feels like a neighborhood that people love and care about. Walking by and seeing the changes is very satisfying. It does something good for my soul. So now let me switch. So in all this, this work, and I'm not going to go into all the details. I walked out of the screen, maybe. Sorry about that, whoever's watching. Um, I'm going to switch now a little bit to firearms because what happened is as we're doing this work, um, Sandy Hook occurs, um, the uh, pulse shooting occurs, the shooting at uh, Parkland High School occurs, and then of course there's the and that's what gets in the news. What doesn't get in the news is the one-off shootings. And I wanted to say a couple of things about firearms. So firearms be, is, is a part of this. And all of the firearm, all of the risk factors that we don't know for sure, but the, it's very much pointing in the same direction that the underlying factors that are relating to violent behavior in kids, aggressive behavior, bullying behavior in kids, that's the precursors that lead up to a firearm, using a firearm. That firearms are sort of the tip of the iceberg, if you will. And, um, you know, rarely 
I don't know if there's any case where somebody wakes up in the morning, brushes their teeth and says, oh, I'm going to get a gun and shoot somebody today. Usually there's all of this other stuff that's happening in the background. Either they're, they've been uh, disrespected, they're isolated, they're uh, bullied, uh, or all three of those. They're abused by their parents. They're seeing violence in the street. They're seeing this is get the way it gets it, um, to solve a problem. They might be carrying a gun because they want to protect themselves because they're afraid as they walk to school. So there's all sorts of these factors that kind of lead to why firearms. So let me just talk a little bit about firearms. It's a little bit of a left turn, but I'm going to bring it back to this. But it was leading us to thinking about, we have to do something about this. And uh, just, just as an example, in 2017, the top line is, is motor vehicles, and the red line is um, uh, homicides by, uh, or death by, by firearms, not only homicides. Another little quick fact about, about firearms, almost 60% of all firearm deaths are suicide. A lot of times when I start a lecture where I'm talking about firearms, I ask people to raise their hand, what do they think of first about guns? And the first thing they think about firearms is homicide. They think that that's the number one cause. It is definitely disparity. It happens more in our urban centers. It definitely happens more in, among people of color, as I, the data I showed earlier. Uh, but the bigger problem actually is uh, middle-aged white men um, committing suicide in, urban, in uh, rural areas. Uh, a little known fact that people immediately think, what do they think of when they think of firearms? But you can see um, at a, around the time of those shootings I mentioned, it starts going up. It's flat, pretty flat. And then around 2014 and in 2017, more people died from a firearm than a motor vehicle crash. And as you can see from these data up to the last two years that it's accelerating for firearms, it is going up, but I think, I think this is starting to flat out again, uh, but firearms is not. So this is, has stayed apart. Um, so it's clearly a national problem. I mean, here's the data on firearms, uh, cause of death overall is, the, is blue, but you can see it's a leading cause. This is where you know, it's leading cause for black youth. Um, you can look at homicides with uh, yellow is suicide, Native Americans. So it's clearly, uh, an issue here. The other thing about firearms that you should know that the, it's not only an urban problem, that actually the rates of firearm death are about the same in rural, suburban, and urban areas. It's just uh, in urban areas, it's more homicide. In, in rural areas, it's more suicide, but the rates are about the same. This is, a, I think, an important point because the other thing, when I talk to people about firearms, the first thing they say is, um, well, they have the solution. All we need to do is this. All we need to do is that. And the answer is not that simple. It's, it's, it takes way more. And this graph, I think, helps depict sort of why it's not quite that simple. The, the purple line is total firearm deaths. And the bottom line, uh, the uh, x-axis is age. So a very, very young age is, you know, you know, it's pretty limited. A little younger, that's, a lot of that's uh, unintentional. Um, we don't like to say accidental uh, because it's predictable. But you can see in the early ages between like ba basically around the middle school, which is why we chose middle school for yes, by the way, but that is where it starts accelerating. The, the highest mortality rates are in the 20s and declines pretty significantly. To the eight, into the 80s, you know, there's hardly any homicide, right? There's hardly any homicide even in the 60s. But when you're in your 20s and 30s, that's where it's all, that's the action for homicide. But look at the opposite is true for suicide. That suicide is definitely happening here, but it's clearly going on at the older ages. So clearly there's not one answer because you, what you might, if you're going to tailor something, you're not going to say the same thing to a 70 year old as you're going to say to a 20, 25 year old. I, I want to show that as a, another example. I show this graph simply because. It's one of the only empirical graphs I ever showed that have show you a perfect correlation. You know, when you see the textbooks, you know, a positive correlation goes like this, negative one goes like this. Well, this is over time gun ownership. And this only goes 2016. There's an estimated over 300 million guns in people's hands privately, privately. 
on average, about four to five guns are owned by uh, by the 30 percent or so households that own a gun in the United States. Now, I also want to start by saying this is not about vilifying people with guns. Let's spin this data in a little bit different way. There are 330 million guns, 30 percent of Americans, about 100 million people, 100 million families have a gun in their home and only 40,000 people die a year. What does that say? That says to me that there's a whole lot of really responsible gun owners in America. That was, and the second thing is, I want to just acknowledge that we, our Supreme Court has decided that people have a right to own guns. We're not a, a, what we're doing, the research we're doing, we're focused on that 40,000. But we want to acknowledge that there are most gun owners are safe, most gun owners are responsible. Um, and this isn't about you know, gun control. This is about injury control. And it's, it's low hanging fruit. People don't need to be dying by firearms. A little, I don't know exactly the numbers on suicide, but most suicides, if they're not successful, are not tried again because it's a cry for help. People get the help. That doesn't mean that people don't commit suicide later or try again. But most attempts that are not successful are turn out to be successful in helping the person stay alive and turn their lives around. They get the therapy, they get their drugs, they get whatever they need, they get the support, they get the issue that was they were dealing with addressed, whether, whether that's a social issue or a personal issue. Um, but 90% of firearms, 90% of uh, efforts uh, that use a, a suicide attempt that uses a firearm, 90% are successful. So they don't get a second chance. But if they could get a second chance, they would probably be alive today. We've got to be able to do better than that. Another interesting fact. Well, what do you think of when you think of firearms? You think about the, the, um, uh, you think about the, the uh, mass shootings that we see in the news. 1% of all firearm deaths are, occur from mass shootings. That doesn't mean to say they're a, they're a horror and they're heinous acts and we shouldn't need, need to pay attention to them, but it does mean that some other stuff is going on. Interestingly, only about 10% of those are actually in schools. So we have all this effort to focus on school safety, which we need to do, but there's lots of other places where mass shootings occur, mostly at the workplace. Uh, we spend a lot of money on it. I'm really conscious of the time, and I know we started late. Um, this is um, just in terms of relative money, we spend um, more money, less money. Uh, obesity costs us less money, and we're not that far off of uh, Medicaid spending, just to give you a sense of how much money that is. This is just a graph of how much, how many people die from the disease per 100,000 versus how much money we spend. You can see HIV is up way up here, uh, but fewer people than firearm violence, which is way down here. That doesn't, this isn't about, so we shouldn't spend as much money on HIV. Don't get me wrong on that. But I find this is interesting, hernias. There's more money spent on hernias than there is on firearm violence, right? Um, anemia than firearm violence. Uh, and you can see that the rates of death are much, much lower. So uh, in terms, sometimes, and this doesn't happen quite as much anymore, but um, the famous words of our former um, Surgeon General um, about firearm violence not being a public health pro problem, it's not our lane, we should get stay out of it, it's, it's criminal justice, not public health. And he says, well, if it's not a health problem, why are so many people dying of it? He said that in 1994. We still are somewhat sometimes fighting that battle. So what we did, and I'm almost done, what we did was we had an opportunity. The National Center for um, Child Health and Human Development said, we're gonna put out a call for uh, proposals to define a field that we, we're, we, we, have, we need, you know, that, that we're the future, basically. I forgot exactly how they spent it, sorry for tripping over those words. But basically to find the future in a field that needs to be developed in child health and human development. A colleague of mine called me and said, Let's do this around firearms. Because again, we're doing this in this environment where all these shootings are occurring and it's getting more and it's obviously an issue. And uh, you know, then she started explaining to me why it was a good idea. 
you know, and I said, you had me as at let's do this. And, you know, uh, we were both full professors and we both said, if we're not going to take the risk, who is? We've been dedicating our careers to this problem. So what we did is we created this consortium of uh, experts across the country that we wanted to build, start building up the pipeline. We did literature reviews. We did pilot studies. We did all sorts of things to sort of try to kickstart the field. And we have reviews, like I said, these, these systematic reviews about what do we know? Because for 30 years, we haven't been, there, there was no federal funding on firearm research and, and specifically. That then led, that directly led to us making a case to the administration at the University of Michigan, who ended up investing $10 million over a five year period. We're in year, we're in year 1.4. Uh, we're not quite at half a year. In, in December, we'll be at half a, one and a half years um, to create an institute university-wide. It's the first one in the country. Uh, there are some, uh, Johns Hopkins, Cal Davis, uh, Tulane, um, they have um, centers, but centers are usually centered in a department. And then while they might work across units, it's not the same as really having an institute that really is intended to integrate people from across campus to address this issue. Um, and we, we conceptualize uh, firearms in, in many different ways, and I'm gonna just quickly tell you what they are. Our cores are research and scholarship where we're uh, gonna do some piloting. We're gonna use some of that money for doing pilot tests for uh, faculty across campus. Um, we have one right now that uh, we're, we're, we've just got refunded or funded by the National Institute of Arts, working with looking at public art so, you know, they're coming from the mural idea. The, the, when there's public art, is there less violence and less firearm violence than in places that are very similar but don't have the public art? And then we're looking at community engaged public art. Does the artist just come in and paint it? Or does the artist talk to the locals to find out what, what, what the history of the neighborhood is and then try to depict that in the picture? Or does the artist say, let's co develop this together? So there's different levels of that can be. Uh, we, have, we got the first uh, NIH training grant around firearms specifically. Um, we had a postdoctoral program in FACS, but this is a T32. Um, we have uh, postdocs who are now working specifically on firearms. Uh, research and scholarship, we're also doing this national study. We have data uh, on um, parent-child uh, dyads. We worked with Gallup, a 2000 person sample. We're gonna redo that. Uh, in, a, in, a, in the fall, uh, spring. Community engagement and communications core, we're developing a community board basically to guide us, to help us think about and, and connect with communities around the state, but also around the nation. We're creating a data repository um, that builds on, uh, in fact, we want created one for youth. We're expanding it for all data. And then we're gonna try to help link it to things like uh, the census data and that sort of thing. And then we have uh, uh, using our, resources to inform policy. Uh, and then our areas of focus include suicide, community violence, mass shootings, intimate partner violence, uh, unintentional injuries, and uh, lethal police force. We have some projects in, um, uh, in school and in community mostly. We have uh, some in intimate partner violence, not very much here, uh, but we're talking about uh, doing some work with uh, locking, uh, locking technology. Um, uh, we have a project with the um, the Eastern uh, District of the Federal uh, of the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, and we're doing a survey of um, police officers and law enforcement officers, so it's sheriffs as well, and asking them about their uh, anti-racism training and what they think about it and their attitudes and, and if they've had it and what they think about that. Uh, and suicide, we're expanding that out too. So I'm gonna stop there um, and say thank you very much. I appreciate um, this opportunity, as I said, and I know it's two, uh, I'm a few minutes over, but we also started a little bit late, so I'm not completely my fault. Um, <laughs> so um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to, to take them. Thank you. You, um, thanks for your presentation and all the work that you were doing. Um, yeah, I think it was impactful. Um, 
thanks for doing it. Uh, the, the institute that you created, I'm really impressed with that um, and the roles that it's taken. I'm curious about the T32, where you at it, since the first cycle of it, what year are you in? Um, we are in year um, 0.5. Um, we just, uh, we have, uh, I think we'll have one more next year. We have currently have four uh, funded and um, we were working on finding some other money. So we have at least two for next year, um, but it's going, it just started. There's four more years to go, uh, basically. So. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I would say if you know people, absolutely. You know, we, the call is out right now. I think they we just posted or we're about to post. Um, we do look. I mean, there are people who are sort of in this field already, so that, that they're going to be more primed to do this work than somebody who wants to be in this field but isn't there yet. Because then, you know, we want to we want to be able to really feed the field because the field has been there's been nobody. When we started that flax project, there were about 12 senior people in the United States doing anything around firearms. I mean, it, it was it's insane. So if you do somebody who's interested, have them do some work in firearms. Have them publish a paper or two and you know, so because we that it's gonna be competitive in that way because we don't have a gazillion spots. Um, but please let them know. Thank you for asking. It's great to see the range of your work and um, especially the use of art um, in building community. That was really awesome. Thanks. Um, I had a question about suicide and, and deaths among um, LGBTQ people. And so you saw that the curve uh, increased with age, um, but do you know more or less how that might function if you take into account LGBTQ youth? Do not. Um, it's an interesting idea. Find somebody at the University of Michigan and we can fund you and them to do it together. I mean, it's, it's University of Michigan money, so it's really in, meant to be internal. So we sort of have this rule that you have to be connected there, but I'm only half joking. Um, but we did just fund as a pilot study an LBGT firearm study. Um, and we're actually doing some qualitative work and then we're gonna do a larger survey to find out to what extent is it a problem. Uh, both interpersonal and, you know, for contemplating uh, self-harm. So that, that is in the books. Um, we actually funded it to the tune of $75,000. So it's a real study. It's not one of these $10,000, you know, try to do something with it. Um, you know, we're hoping that it'll turn into an R01. Um, uh, I don't know if you know Christy Campbell. Do you know Christy? Uh, I know her work. Right. And uh, Christy is a colleague of uh, our, our colleague Elizabeth. Yeah, they're very good friends, actually. But um, reach out to her, ask her what she's doing, doing with it and stuff. And, um, but yeah, we, we are work moving in that direction. It's not specifically suicide. It's more, um, do they feel they need protection? That's the number one reason that people say there are for protection. You should know that the few studies that have been done, um, looking at the questions, does it really protect you? Uh, the answer is no, you're more likely to be hurt by, by that gun or a loved one than you actually protecting yourself. Regardless of the fact that you do see in the media, you know, somebody said, you know, stop the robbery because they pulled out the gun. I mean, I, I've talked to an FBI agent about arming teachers, and she was like, it's the most insane thing I've ever heard. You know, was like, you know, people in real life don't wear, a, you know, good guy and bad guy hats. So if, you know, there's people who are armed in a school and you don't know who's shooting. I mean, it's just, you, you know, and bullets don't know where they're going. You know, and they bounce off things and, you know, it, it's just not uh, more guns isn't necessarily the, the solution to these issues. But we create this this world of, you know, it's a really dangerous world out there. You have to protect yourself and, you know, and never more than during elections. But. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate hearing about um, sort of the focus on the physical environment and, and that type of strategy. I was wondering if you or any of your colleagues had um, done anything around social media environment that people are exposed to and that as a potential intervention strategy. Yeah, that's a really good question. Let, let me just, one thing I did neglect to say is um, make no mistake about it. First of all, we uh, I'm, I'm really proud of the work we're doing in terms of uh, neighborhood because we're not putting it on the individuals. It's not like we have to change the individuals. They just need to be less violent. 
we need to make places that feel like safer and better to live in, right? Uh, and those places aren't you know, lots of vacancy by accident. Those places are redlined, uh, con many policies around uh, you know, educational opportunities, employment opportunities, uh, in the cities, uh, opportunities for um, uh, transportation to jobs. Well, I had a colleague who was doing um, uh, uh, stroke intervention research and helping people learn the signs and then call 911. And the first thing she did is some focus groups. She did some qualitative data in in uh, in Flint, and the and the people were telling her, "We're not going to call 911. They're never going to come if we call. The only way they're going to get to the hospital is if we take them." She was shocked, right? She was, you know, and she had done her um, medical school training in Detroit, and she was shocked to hear that. So there's it's not a, there's not an accident that where where the um, vacancy occurs. I, mean, I want to be really clear about that. So that's the idea that we're trying to re transform neighborhoods. The other thing is we talk about it being community engaged. We just published a paper comparing three different conditions, um, semi-randomly assigned. The, the community-based condition or the community engaged condition could not be um, randomly assigned because that was a, a community program. People had to apply. They got some money to do it. But then we had two other conditions on, on the school, on the um, uh, on their properties that they own, some that they could get to to mow, professional mow, and some that they couldn't. Those were control sites. And we, we controlled for all the neighborhood kind of variables. And we found that um, the uh, control sites crime went up a little bit, but in the professional mow sites, it, you know, there was about one less crime per square mile pre-post. Um, and in the, in the uh, community engaged was two, twice as good. However, well, I don't want to, you know, it feels like we just, uh, well, the neighborhoods aren't good. Well, it's too bad that that's the way, way they are. It's the community's responsibility. It, it takes the village to turn it around. It's not just the responsibility of the of the residents. And the police were uh, supportive of, of what they were doing and would, in, would um, uh, circle the neighborhoods more. The um, city council was, you know, providing some services. Land Bank had these these resources for those. So, um, it, it doesn't, it's not just on the re residents, but to come back, you know, full circle, no, we haven't done work on, uh, social media in facts. We did have a project that it didn't really go anywhere, but we had a pilot where we were going to look at what happens in social media post a ma mass shooting, if it were to occur. Um, fortunately there weren't any to really follow. Uh, and, but the technology now has gotten much better than it was. You know, the facts is we're on a carryover year at this point, but that was happened five, you know, six years ago at this point. So uh, the technology and Michigan now has access to Twitter and downloading. And so we are talking about some of some of that work, and uh, let's collaborate on something. Thank you so, so much, much for your attention and being here. I appreciate it. Yeah.